I mean, hey, I could have kept going. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, just give it up one more time for Scooter Braun. I mean, what? Come on. So I feel like we all know you as this mega manager to stars like Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, Carly Rae Jepsen, Kanye West. Um, but I feel like long before that, you made a name for yourself in Atlanta promoting parties while you were still in college. And your big break in the music industry came when you were, uh, when the producer Jermaine Dupri discovered, discovered you essentially and brought you on to So So Def as the head of marketing. And you were only 19 at the time? I was, yeah, I was about to turn 20. Right, and so here you are, and you dropped out of college your sophomore year and to pursue this full time with, uh, with Jermaine Dupri. And so I just found it so interesting that you're this 19 year old kid and So So Deaf being so huge at the time, like just churning out every major artist, like hip hop and R&B. What did Jermaine see in you at ninth, at, when you were just 19 for him to say like, hey, I trust this guy as head of marketing? My dance skills. Yeah, I mean, hey, I saw you, I saw you thumping that foot, man. Um, That's... I think, so Atlanta was an interesting place. I, I, I graduated high school in 2000, and I went down to, uh, to Georgia to actually play D3 basketball at Emory. And then when I got go? there, I was like, no one cares <laughs> about watching us play. Um, and I had a best friend who was playing at a big D1 program, and I just had FOMO of like not being the little white dude at the end of the bench. I was like, I should have done that, and I could have done the celebrations. I would have like done the dab early. Um, but what happened with Jermaine is I started throwing parties, and my parties, I had the DJs playing hip hop and rock and roll. And it was a very diverse crowd because it was college kids. And Atlanta at the time was very segregated. So you had, really, they would say, oh, that's a black party. Mm -hmm. And it would be hip hop. And they'd say, that's a white party. And it would be techno. And I didn't really enjoy techno. <laughs> so um, when Jermaine started coming to my, my parties, he was very fascinated to see multicultural crowd going crazy for music he made. Right. Um, and we became friends. And I still remember when he asked me to join him, I just helped Ludacris. Ludacris was the first rapper I helped. Um, he was actually a disc jockey on the radio in Atlanta and named Chris Lova Lova. Yeah. <laughs> and he and his manager Shaka actually found me first and they asked me to help kind of promote their music in my parties and they gave me this record called Throw Them Bows. Oh, yeah. um, and I started doing that and then Jermaine met me and Jermaine is not uh, what you call a tall man. No, um, I, so I didn't want to say it, but you he, know. He's, he's tiny. <laughs> um, and he had me meet him at this place, this lounge in Midtown. And I'll never forget, because he was talking to me about my career and how I should come kind of run marketing for So So Def, but he was on this stool and his feet were dangling. <laughs> and I was this, you know, almost 20 year old kid and I was just staring at him, just like completely amused that his feet wouldn't touch the bottom. Because um, I grew up a very, very short kid, so I was kind of feeling him. Um, <laughs> And uh, I mean, I was really, I was 4'11 my freshman year of high school. It was, oh, wow. I was really small. Um, Bless your heart. And uh, <laughs> thank you. And, you know, he kind of gave me this opportunity and uh, I kind of just ran with it. I mean, so when you, when you had this conversation with him, I mean, what, what did he see in your skill set? Like what, like, what was it about you to say, I'm going to take a bet on this kid? Well, I, I kind of, made my own name in Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, I turned those college parties into some of the biggest parties in the city and then I expanded. And by the time Jermaine met me in that first year, uh, we were the largest college promotion company in the US revenue wise. Wow. Um, and he was seeing kind of me building my own business and he was very fascinated. So a lot of guys came from parties. Leor Cohen came from being a concert promoter. Um, Russell Simmons was in a dorm room and you know, I'm sorry, Rick Rubin was in a dorm room, Russell Simmons was a party promoter, and they teamed up. So Jermaine, you know, his hero is Russell Simmons, and he saw Lior team up with Russell. So he used to call me his little Lior. Uh, I had another nickname, White Puff. Um, uh, and, you know, he, he kind of saw something in me that maybe I didn't even see it myself at the time. Right. And I feel like promotion and marketing is something that is almost innate in you because it's you had this insanely successful career and then you transitioned that directly into working at So So Deaf. And I'm just curious to know like what, because I think it's one thing to have raw talent in something, but 
how you cultivate that is what's really important. So between then and now, how would you say you've cultivated that raw talent you have for marketing and promotion? Um, how did I cultivate it? I tried. Hmm. You know, I, I was raised by two, I, I was very lucky. I came from a household with two incredibly supportive, amazing parents. Um, my parents were extremely tough on us, especially me, uh, and they demanded a lot from us. Um, but they also instilled in us that you can do anything. And that idea is kind of, if you actually really think about it, is unrealistic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but I didn't know it to be unrealistic. So everything I went after, I was like, why not me? You know, if we're all created equal, like my parents saw me, well, why can't I be that guy? Yeah. Or why can't I, you know, reach that level? Why not? And I just continue to try. And sometimes the things that would drive me would be disrespect by other people. And that short kid from freshman year would kick in and I'm gonna prove you wrong. Um, sometimes it was the fear, which I still have today. I mean, I still go to bed now at 37 years old, scared of what tomorrow might bring. And it, it drives me not to be complacent. Um, but I think you don't really know until you get out and try. And I wouldn't say I really cultivated anything. I, I, there's a lot of people who I, I think are smarter than me, um, who've worked as hard as me. Um, but along the way, I got lucky. And I've never taken that for granted. So I, I don't really act like I deserve this because at any moment, I think it can be taken away. And I right. think uh, what I try to do is just wake up each morning and, and give an effort and allow the people around me to give an effort also. All right. I mean, do you feel like you still have that same energy now as when you first started your company? No. Because I think, see that? I'm exhausted. No, <laughs> no, because that's the thing. I feel like a lot of people. Did you, think about the names you mentioned when I got on this stage. <laughs> you did it to yourself. I mean, okay. these are people, I mean, this is exhausting, guys. <laughs> Just take one of them for one week. Um, they're wonderful people. <laughs> I'm going to say, well, wow. <laughs> But, um, no, it, it, look. It, I had a lot of energy as a kid. I, I, I probably for 10 years slept two to four hours a night. Um, and I still remember, I gained a lot of weight over 10 years too. I kind of lost myself <laughs> there a little bit there. Um, and, and I still remember there was this conversation probably when I was about 28 where my dad said, you know, I feel like you're working so much, you're not taking any time for you. And I remember looking at him and saying, I'm trying to do something no one's ever done before. So now is not the time for me to vacation. And I missed out on a lot of things, but I figured it out later. And um, I, I just think that, you know, I said the other day I was doing this interview and I said the success and failure are neighbors. Yeah. They live right next door to each other. And sometimes when you're, when you're with failure, you don't realize success is waiting for you right next door. Yeah. And the only thing you can do to get there is just keep pushing through. So I have no regrets on, on how hard I work because it gave me this incredible life that I have now. And, um, the best part of my life is when I met my wife and now I have my kids, um, which is the part that I just, that got really lucky. I mean, she still hasn't figured it out. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I think, do I have the same energy now? Probably not, but I know how to work more efficiently now. Um, I used to think everything was so important and everything had to be done and I had to win at every single moment. And the drama was real to me. Um, but since I had my children, I understand getting home for bedtime is more important, you know, and I'm actually more efficient. I've had the last three to four years have been the best years of my entire career, both spiritually and financially, because I realized that I don't have to be in every single moment. It's okay to let time do it for me and, uh, and be in the moment with people. Right. That's big. And, you know, I think, just going back to when you left SoSoDuff, because I feel like there, you were starting to get really restless in terms of no one saw, you saw the potential that social media had like way back when to have that reach and influence and really start building brands for, uh, for your talent roster. And they weren't really seeing that. Like they didn't see your vision. It wasn't just Jermaine, it was. it was everyone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone it's, thought I was crazy. Right, and so like now, I mean, now we see that obviously you were right because social media is, is just imperative in terms of anybody, let it, just musical acts is just an example of building your brand and having that reach, having that influence. And so now, how, how are you looking at social media in terms of building your marketing strategy, whether it's for you? Because the thing is like, you have 
some, you have like more followers than some of the people that you represent. And so you're building your brand along with building the brands of some of your acts. So what is your thinking when I, I think, social media? Look, I think movies, like we did Never Say Never with Justin years ago and a lot of us got followers that way. Um, but I think movies like Social Network made entrepreneurs start getting followed mm -hmm. because people saw Mark in that movie and they thought, well, I'm not gonna be, for me, it was Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. Like, you're not, I don't have those skills. Um, so, well, this is gonna be super awkward for me. I just gotta point this out. The guy who just walked Go in, on. I usually don't see people in the crowd. My father has never watched me speak. Wait, your dad is here? Oh! <laughs> so, I just, I just wanna be really, re I don't even know how he knew to be here, but I just wanna be really clear. I'm not saying anything nice about him anymore. <laughs> That's done. We did it just for you. Yeah, um, welcome. Um, all right, where was I? Cause that threw me off. <laughs> Um, We're talking about uh, uh, social media and like how do you build okay. your strategy and all that. So when I started, people really did think I was crazy. You know, I, I kind of saw these trends and I thought, well, we can reach people around the world so quickly. And I saw a chance to be intimate with people because when you're watching that screen, it's not all the influence of other people. It's just you in the moment. Peer pressure is not on you. And, you know, if I react, I assume everyone else reacts because I find myself to be pretty normal. Um, I don't really think I have an extraordinary skill. I think my skill is being ordinary. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the, the extraordinary skill is maybe me being way too confident <laughs> that it, other people are going to believe it. Um, but I remember people saying to me, which sounds crazy now, oh, that's just a YouTube artist. Hmm. You know, like people viewing them on YouTube won't make them a star. And now every single artist out there is trying to get their YouTube numbers up and their right. Spotify numbers up and their you know, social media followers up. So to me, it's always about authenticity. You know, in today's world, David Bowie couldn't do what he used to do. He couldn't take off the makeup and then go to the corner store. Right. Someone would have a camera phone in their face. And um, so you have to be who you truly are. Uh, and we try to just promote that authentically uh, as best we can. Um, and I try to tell them to ignore you know, people making assumptions because there's a lot of loud noises and everyone has equal footing, you know, in social media. So, I mean, there's probably like 10,000 people who think I make people get engaged. Um, <laughs> that is, I, yeah, no. Um, uh, and, but it'd be a cool like thing if I could actually pull that, that off. Yeah. Um, I'd have like a bunch of friends. I'd be like, you now. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think you, you work on spreading authenticity. And the truth is now it's changing. I'm 37 years old. I'm slowly getting out of touch. And I was, I'm starting to realize this, that there are some artists that I like that, you know, I'm starting to see artists become big yeah. and I'm not getting it. Right. I'm like, well, why are you, why are there tattoos on your face? <laughs> like, I, like I, I don't understand how that, why, why are you getting more tattoos on your face? Like, well, <laughs> um, so, You're turning it to a curmudgeon, and it's fine. But that's what I'm it's saying. Like, I'm, the, I'm getting to be that old dude <laughs> right. that I used to be like, you don't get it. So what I now need to do is bet on the young people in my business. Yeah. It's a youth-driven business, and whether it be in TV, film, or music, or even tech, I have to trust the young people. And um, sometimes they're not always going to get it right. Sometimes I'm not going to get it right, but we put trust in each other, and all you need, which I've learned with myself, is you need that one win and then everyone remembers you as some kind of genius. Right. So um, I encourage them to take risks, I encourage them to go after it, and I'll back them. And if we're wrong, we're wrong. And if you're wrong like four times in a row, then we're gonna have a conversation. <laughs> but um, you're allowed to be wrong a couple times and you know we'll get there. And that actually, that ties into what I, I really wanted to, to ask you because I think everybody knows by now the story of how you discovered Justin Bieber. You stumbled across one of his videos on YouTube, you uh, just, saw some potential in him, flew his mom and him down you to Atlanta. You tell him in such a better way than Kevin Hart did at the roast. Oh, Jesus. I mean, like. <laughs> he was like, you're a grown man in the middle of the night named Scooter in your See? underwear on a couch. <laughs> looking at a little boy who's singing. Why were you not arrested? Listen. 
<laughs> oh man, I would never phrase it like that. My God, that can go left in so many ways. Um, it just did. I know you, you <laughs> did it to yourself. But I think it, it was one of those things like where I feel like people don't necessarily know just how relentless you were. Because I came across an interview where you mentioned you were trying to get information about Justin based on the like pictures or plaques that he had in the background of it the was, video. It was the banners in the back of the church. So a lot of the videos that Justin posted where people didn't know I was there, I was a part of it at that point. But I wanted it to stay authentic. So you, if you actually right. watch those early videos, you'll notice Justin never introduces himself. He never says, my name is Justin, this song is. And the reason why I told him to continue doing that and never introduce himself, even when he got fans, he's like, should I say my name? And, you know, and I said, no, because I wanted it to feel kind of voyeuristic. I wanted people mm -hmm. to feel like they were seeing something that maybe in, they didn't think they should see. Right. So it became more special. Um, and that first video, you know, he had like three or four videos up and one of them he was seeing Neo So Sick and I just kind of clicked like, this is the kid I'm looking for. Right. So I was a big Michael Jackson fan. Right. And Michael used to sing these love songs with this angelic voice that made us believe in love because it reminded us before we got jaded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and there was banners in the back and I, you know, he has a different last name than his mom. So she's a single mom. So I was trying to find him and I Googled the company in the background of the church contest and found that it was a part of Ontario, Canada, and then I called all the school boards. So you stalked him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the story just gets worse. <laughs> and his but, mom called to get rid of me. But to that point, I mean, so where's the line between following your gut and an empty pursuit? Because you, you did pour a lot of money into, into this, and it was something that I think you, you gave yourself about a little over a year to make it work, and it wasn't until like maybe month 11 that it really started clicking. So it's funny. I'm about to tell this story with my dad here. Um, hey, dad. <laughs> okay, I. That's where I talk about success and failure living next yeah. door to each other. Right. So I worked at Sosodef when I was about 20 years old. I left when I was just turning 24. Um, I left for a lot of different reasons, and I had a calling card of doing this big deal for Ludacris with Pontiac that I kind of used to do some consulting. And I went and looked for artists. And the first artist I found on MySpace was this guy, Asher Roth. And we had a big hit with I Love College. Um, and the check from Asher's publishing deal actually saved the company in this moment you're talking about. So I had Justin and his mom living, uh, don't tell Donald Trump this, but illegally. Um, uh, Jesus. And in a townhouse under my name with Aaron Rent's furniture that I was paying for. I was paying the bills for schooling. I was paying for everything. Right. And I had Asher and his friends living in a dump around the corner, um, which we called the greenhouse because they smoked so much weed. And, and then uh, we put like a studio in the basement where we cut a lot of the records. And I was at month 11 of 13 months of money I'd saved up before I go broke. And everyone in Atlanta thought I was killing it and had no idea that I had risked it all. I hadn't done any, I said, I'm not doing parties cold turkey. And uh, my dad actually called to check on me and say, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? And we started talking and out of nowhere, I just broke down crying, admitting to him that I was about to run out of money and had nothing to fall back on and that I was a failure and no one knew. And uh, he gave me really good advice. He said, well, you came this far, you got two more months, see it through. And then the next day, Asher came in and played me out of college. And the following month, I was able to get so much hype from that record that I was able to cut a publishing deal uh, at South by Southwest by inviting the head of Universal Publishing to a bar, and then I invited the head of Sony ATV Publishing to the bar across the street. <laughs> and I would walk back and forth, but I was like, oh no, there's no one else bidding. But I made sure they saw each other. <laughs> and um, they immediately started bidding back and forth, and that deal saved the company, saved me, the commission, um, and I was this close. I mean, I was playing for Pizza with Change, <laughs> And I, I was a grown man crying on the phone to my dad. There's no shame in that. <laughs> Just I saying. agree. I agree, but I really, I really did come this close. And um, when you ask me kind of what the difference is mm -hmm. of you know, pushing it too far, there is no difference. You know, there's, I got lucky. You know, I got lucky. It, it wasn't, you, you work really, really hard. And sometimes it happens for people early in life. And sometimes it happens for them later in life. And that, that isn't up to you. What's up to you is when you quit. You know, so if you just keep trying, it eventually will turn your way. And for me, I got very lucky it happened to me early. I don't know why, but somebody upstairs helped me out. 
Um, in okay. a major way, because I feel like in your company, SP Projects, is going into its 10th year now. So I feel like in, in, those, in those nine, 10 years, it is... It's like 12 now, actually. 12. Yeah, yeah. So in, that's still a relatively short amount of time, but it's, you've done so much since then because... I got lucky a lot. I mean, clearly, <laughs> clearly, because you have, you have you know, your music management, you have, but you're also branching out. You have um, your, your tech incubator. You have uh, your co-owning... You just announced today uh, that you and Drake, of all people, are going in on this uh, this e-commerce, this e-sports company, 100 Thieves. You also have uh, you partnered with Gary Vaynerchuk uh, for that art startup. Like you have so many different buckets that you're working in now, just be just beyond your management company with artists. So, what really is the end goal here? Because you you're you're digging your heels into so many different parts of entertainment. So, like what? What is your end goal with all this? Please tell me, because I'm trying to figure it out. I'm Listen, tired. Listen, I mean... Tell me when to stop. No. <laughs> you, man. <laughs> um, look, I, I... It's another story about you. Sorry. Here we go. You decided to show I feel up. like we should just bring him on stage. No, no. Don't point. do that. Like, Please, <laughs> God. Don't do that. Um, when I was a kid, uh, a teacher um, told me... This is kind of... I apologize if anyone gets insulted by this story, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, they told me I was probably ADD or ADHD. And um, they wanted me to take pills. Um, and it was kind of the easy way out. I was having trouble in school. I wasn't paying attention. I had so many things going on in my mind. I was a good student, but I just couldn't focus. And um, this teacher tried, this counselor tried to bring in my parents and tell them that they wanted me to take pills. Um, and my dad asked the counselor, so what did they do before ADHD? And she said, excuse me, and I'm hyped. I'm like, I get to take some pills that make me focus, and I get to take longer <laughs> on my test. Like, let's go. Um, and my dad goes, what did they do before this? And they said, well, we don't understand. He goes, before this thing you just said, we just give the kid pills, what did they do before? Because I'm sure, you know, before ADHD, like, did they give them pills? And he said, well, no, we just discovered this. And, and my dad goes, I don't think my son has ADHD. I think he's lazy. <laughs> and... Um, he told them, don't ever offer my kid pills again. And I guarantee you I have ADHD or ADD. Like, <laughs> um, but that being said, he wouldn't let me take the pills. He wouldn't let me take the easy way out. Um, and my superpower is probably my ability to focus on a lot of different things at the same time because I had to learn the hard way how to adapt. Um, and my parents pushed me, and they wouldn't accept anything less. They said, if you have problems focusing, you have, a, you have to find a different way to focus. Right. So the way my brain works, I can kind of deal with a lot of things at the same time. And, um, but that's only because I was forced to. Um, so when you ask me kind of what the end goal is, the, young, the end goal is to never get bored, but never let my my drive and my, um, my ego for more get in the way of my family. Yeah. You know, I had an intern ask me, what would make you stop? And I said, if I thought I was losing my wife or my kids, I would stop. And right now, I still make it home when I'm, when I'm in LA, which is a lot now these days. Um, and I tell my clients, if you can't deal with that, fire me. Um, I get home for bath time every day. And I wake Aww. up with the kid. That's, yeah. No, that's ma that's it's that is absolutely major, and I feel like it's because when you look at your resume, you just I just wonder like how does he do it all? And with two kids and one more on the way, like how in the world does he get it all done? But I just love I have a really 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 good team. Yeah. I don't do it all. My name's on yeah. the door, right. but I will tell you, Allison Kay, who's been with me over a decade, um, and she's a partner in the company. Alice and I, like, I'll come up on this stage and talk. Allison won't do this. Just, she just refuses. Like, when our artists would win awards, Allison would be like, I'm leaving. And she would, like, <laughs> leave the room so they couldn't thank her. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you without a doubt, if it wasn't for her, the company it would not be where it is. It wouldn't exist. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's funny because uh, I'm watching all this debate in our country right now when it comes to equal pay to women and equal opportunity and everything else. And I can tell you without a doubt, my company and all these accolades would not exist without the women that work there. And we're over 50% women. Wow. So, um, so uh, 
Yeah, I, I just, I think I have a really, really good team and I have a wife who doesn't accept anything less than the best of me. Yeah. So even when I'm frustrated, I remember, uh, so for those of you guys who don't know, my wife is the founder of Fuck Cancer. Yeah. Um, and she just, she's a badass. She just announced this deal. She's now a senior advisor to Bumble. And um, wow. so I remember coming home and we didn't even have kids at the time. Uh, we just got engaged. And, you know, it was during what I called the rough Justin Bieber patch. <laughs> you guys probably didn't even see anything about that. Um, and, you know, it had been like four days in a row where I was just really just beat up and just trying so hard. And uh, I kept bringing home and she said, you can't bring this home to bed. And I, in the classic entertainment executive asshole mode go this is how I provide a lifestyle and you know this is like you know and this is like what I do for a living and and my wife just looked at me and she goes okay cool you're right I'm gonna bring my work home to bed so I'm gonna bring the chemo that I was dealing with to bed Ooh, and checkmate. I sorry. immediately went I'm sorry thank you and I love you and I shut up <laughs> and the truth is my wife and a lot of people in this world they deal with problems I deal with inconveniences hmm. along the way I've had to deal with problems. What happened in Manchester was a problem. Um, but 90% of the time, if not more, it's not a problem and my wife gives me that perspective. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of, I mean, you mentioned Justin Bieber's rough patch, um, which we all saw ad nauseum, but I feel like it's, you know, you you are with some of these acts and you experience you know, the highest of highs in terms of chart success and video views, but also the lowest of lows. And so is there a cutoff point for you when a client proves too problematic or controversial? Yeah, um, when I feel like I'm no longer helping them and they're just hurting me. And that is far, far down the road from where the public thinks it is. Um, I remember an executive who's a very, very powerful executive in the music industry, who told me when Justin was going through his problems, you have so many other artists, you've had an amazing career, good run with the kid, move on from him, he's done, move on. And this guy had interest right. in Justin. Um, but if I walked away and quit on him then, I'm, I'm not who I claim to be. You know, like you don't quit on people because they're down. That's when you find out if you're actually there for somebody. Um, so the, the, other, the other, only place that it gets kind of, you know, and then I'll, I'll say to people, like, I'll never quit on you as a friend. I did it recently. I won't go on who, but um, mm -hmm. I said, I won't quit on you as a friend because I never want someone to be in a, a bad place and they can't pick up the phone to talk to me. But I will say right now I can't work with you professionally. Um, and I never put that out there publicly, yeah. but it's a conversation between me and them. And, and you know, for brand wise, I could tweet it and everyone say, oh, you're off the hook. But it's just not the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, the people that know, know, and time will show what it is. But I just think we're, we're very quick to be divisive and to point fingers at each other and, you know, just abandon people when they're down. But that's not how you grow. You have to challenge each other and you have to be there for each other. And, and that's how you get to a better place. All right. And so do you, find that's, do you find that's a difficult place to operate because it seems like you are actively separating your, your personal feelings from your professional, your, from your well, professional I don't. feelings? Oh. I don't. Um, that's what I mean by I've never had a problem standing up for what I believe in and making a very clear difference. Right. Um, you know, I, and I, I say to people, if I get to a point where, you know, I think, uh, they need help and they refuse to help themselves, that's when I tell them privately, I'm not going to help you professionally until you take responsibility for yourself. Because I, what I learned through the experience with Justin was that it's not on me, that I need to be a rock, that I need to be there, but the person who makes the change is that person. Right. You know, and what you need to be is to be a stable force in their life so they know where to turn when they need help. Um, and that's why, like, I. When it comes to Justin, I've been given credit from time to time for kind of the transformation from when we did the bad years to when Purpose came out. We had this amazing run. Um, but the credit's his. 
You know, he was the one that woke up one day as a young man who, had to, who was the most Googled person on the planet through his entire adolescence. And he woke up one day and said, I'm going to make a change, can you help me? And I can tell you it's, it's him that did that because for a year and a half to two years, I tried every day to make that change happen and I failed. So the best advice I ever got in being a manager or being an executive was from great parents or counselors. You know, it's how you treat someone as a human being goes a lot further than how you treat them as a product. Yeah, and kind of on that note, I know that uh, speaking of some of your clients, I know Ariana Grande fired you in 2016, I think it was, and it was early 2016 and then she came back later that yeah. same year. So I feel like in situations like that, people have a tendency to get a little bit defensive and they may not be as honest with themselves and realizing the part they played in that situation. So for you, I mean, in what way had, did getting fired make you a better manager, if at all? I think I watched another manager get fired. Um, and it was a manager, so our company privately, I'm not gonna name who, but we own a bunch of other management companies, which we've never announced, and there's been speculation, but we do. Um, <laughs> I'm not, not gonna say what they are, but that kind of gives you context. So one of the other managers that we own got fired a long time ago. Um, and I watched this manager defend themselves instantly and put out a lot of truths. Um, and I watched the artist see those truths, not want to deal with it, and then forever hate that manager. And what I chose with Ariana is I could have said a lot of stuff. In fact, my team wanted me to because they were pissed. Right. And I said, we're not going to say a word. And this is going to come back around. And at the time, they were like, never take her back. And, and, um, but uh, I just said, let's stay quiet and let's let our truth be our actions. Um, and when shitty boyfriends leave, um, <laughs> she started to see uh, you know, the light on some stuff. And then one day I got a phone call and she goes, can you come see me tomorrow? And I said, no, I'm busy. Oh, playing hard to get. No, I had a client. I had a client who actually had not fired me, who I had to be with. Um, and I said, but I could see you like on Thursday. And she right. said, great. And I went over there and we had a very honest conversation. And where it made me a better manager is a couple things. Number one, um, it allowed me to know that I can be fired. I'd never been fired before. It allowed me to know that as much as you give to people in a service business, uh, which is, you know, we do a lot of asset business, but this part is a service business. And as much as you give, you can never expect anyone to reciprocate. Um, that's not what caring about someone is. Uh, you care and you just have to do it for the right reasons. And if you get screwed over in the end, so be it. And hope you had a hell of a ride along the time. And, um, and I had to learn that lesson because one of my mentors told me every artist is gonna break your heart. And I used to fight that, but now I realize these, this situation will break your heart because it becomes so personal and your job is 90% of the time you're keeping stuff out of their sight to keep the pressure off of them. So how could they ever appreciate you as much as you think you should be appreciated? Because they don't even know half the stuff you do. So that was one and um, number two, it made me and her really tight. Because now when we get into those fights where she's coming at me, I just go, whoa, 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 whoa. You wanna go back to where we once were? Right. And then it kind of calms down. Um, and I really think that the relationship we had from being fired to getting back together gave us the strength for what we never imagined could come that following year. Right. Absolutely. And you know, I think, because as I mentioned, you know, with, with, your, with your talent roster, you've definitely seen the highs and highs. But to that end, when it comes to someone like, you know, say, for example, Carly Rae Jepsen, like Call Me Maybe, like biggest song, biggest song of that year, like huge. And, and then her follow-up album, it didn't perform as well. I mean, it was it critically received. It did in Japan. It did in Japan. In <laughs> Japan, hey, that's a market. It counts. That counts. Japan you actually is a bigger music market than here. Take your wins, man. On I'm the physical tough. side, it's pretty amazing. So, I mean, that's so stateside, though. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't necessarily perform as well as I think. I'm gonna go back to a Japan. Lot of people. <laughs> no, go ahead. I mean, so 
I think a lot of people are just, they, it's almost like asking you to make lightning strike twice. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you had this hit, like do it again. Can I tell you a really funny story Please. when you say that? So my friend, Scott, who's my, uh, he's our head of business development, a CEO, um, he sends me this video a couple years back and it's this slightly overweight Korean man <laughs> doing a horse dance. <laughs> and he's like, check this out, isn't it funny? And it had like, I don't know, like 40,000 views at the time. And his friend had sent it to him, who was Korean American, who knew about Korean music. And I saw it, and I went, Macarena, Cotton Eye Joe, I know what this is. <laughs> like, like this is this is a wedding bar mitzvah song. And um, and I was like, find him. And Scott wrote back, like, what do you mean find him? And I said, I want to sign this. It's going to be the biggest song in the world. And he was like, Are you insane? You want to make this in English? And I said, No, no, no. I want to keep it in Korean. <laughs> and to Scott's credit, ten days later my backyard had Psy in it, and he had a translator. And we started talking, and he was very fascinating. He goes, you know, his translator, he wanted to do it in English. I said, no, no, no. When I was younger, there was a song by Snow called Informer. And oh, wow. everyone, raise your hand if you know this song. Okay, great. For those people who don't know, you look it up, it's great. Um, <laughs> but I memorized this song when I was a kid. To this day, I have no idea what I was saying. Um, but, it, but I loved memorizing. I was so proud to kind of say it. So I was thinking, kids are going to memorize Korean. They're going to, son of hey, like they don't know what they're saying. <laughs> and, um, and I explained this to Sai and he's very amused and all of a sudden, this is 45 minutes of going back and forth, how I want to sign him. He says, if you can make it top 100 in America, I'll give you the song for free through his translator. I said, I can't take it for free, I have to pay you. I'm going to give you a really big royalty, but I'll buy the master and the copyright outside of Korea, great, great deal. Um, but I gave him a big royalty because I knew it was going to be like a big song and I wanted him to feel good. <laughs> and and um, all of a sudden, at the very end, he just looks at me, and I'm waiting to see if he's going to do the deal, and the translator looks at him, and all of a sudden, he looks away from the translator directly in my eyes, and he says, in English, if you come drinking soju with me tonight, I'll do the deal. <laughs> and I looked at him after 45 minutes, and I was like, you speak English? <laughs> and he looks directly back at me, and he goes, I went to Berkeley. <laughs> um, but that whole fun story, when we did Gangnam Style, it ended up going number one around the world for like 22 weeks, and I'm selling like 24 million copies, and you know, crazy, crazy stat, biggest song in the world, first video to go to a billion views. Um, and when we were done, all these people were like, but can you do it again? First of all, we did, we did put out Gentleman, it went number five on Billboard, which is pretty funny. But, um, but I, I kind of looked at everyone like, are you kidding? <laughs> like, this is a like, slightly overweight Korean man doing a horse dance in Korean in the United States, and you want me to do it again? It was never the point to do it again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, look, I think that's the rat race. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's important to sometimes really write down what your goals are and the things you want to get so that you don't let other people's expectations, which change, right. define who you are. And I also think with my business, uh, unfortunately, there's been a lot of suicide over the last decade in, in the entertainment business, especially the music business. And I think that's because we're such a high profile business that when you see anyone in your life that you grew up with, they always have 100 questions. Even if you're like not even close to the artist, but you work at the label or an anything, and you start to think your self-worth is tied up in this job. And it's not, it's just not the truth. Your self-worth is in your relationships with your friends and your family. Right. And you know, I, I just refuse to let myself get caught up in that rat race because otherwise I'll end up being depressed like so many managers before me and I'm just not gonna let that happen. Right. And you know, I think it's obviously you took a huge, a huge gamble with someone like Cy, but also, you know, you're very you've been very wise in making uh, and taking bets and making investments in, in not only people but also companies because I know like you're an early investor in Spotify and Uber and you know almost with Facebook but I feel like it's one of those things that uh, you might yeah you go for it because it's a sad what he story. just said it's, it's not sad my life's okay yeah, but it could have um, been so much better Emory was one of the first eight schools that Facebook the Facebook.com launched at and I thought wow this is a really great way for me to promote my parties without having to hack the school database over and over again. Um, 
So I contacted on the contact page, it was like master of dragons, master of coin. Like it was, it was like some really nerdy stuff going on there. And, um, but I contacted a kid at Harvard named Mark Zuckerberg on his .edu Harvard address. And he said, hey, talk to Eduardo, he handles the finances. And for four months, Eduardo and I negotiated back and forth on email uh, for me to invest in Facebook. And it was 50 grand for me and 50 grand for my friend Drew Gooden who had just gone to the NBA. And Drew just trusted me because he used to come to my parties. And, um, <laughs> and we were buying 10% of Facebook for 100 grand. <laughs> and um, I got an email from Eduardo, I still have it, it says, hey, Mark wants to launch 32 more schools in two weeks and just doesn't feel comfortable taking any investment at this time. I'm so sorry. You know, if you're ever in Boston, let me know. And the truth is, I could have closed. If I would have gone up to Boston, I probably, I know myself, I would have closed. But my high school sweetheart was at BC and it just broken my heart. And um, I was not going to Boston. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I ended up losing out on that one. Because you're in your feelings. No, but it was fine. I actually <laughs> saw Eduardo years later when I was on tour and he like lives in Singapore. And someone like, he was the same place as me and they were like, do you know Eduardo Severin? And I told him who I was and he was like, oh, by the way, Mark and I were already kind of separating. He wasn't going to let me take any investment. There was like four or five of you guys. You had no shot. Oh, okay. And See, I, there you go. And I felt so much better. <laughs> but life's worked out. I mean, to that point, so what, what is it about a company or talent that really blips on your radar? Like, what is it about someone or, or a company that just says, like, hey, I want to take a bet on you? Um, because this goes back to just the announcement like with the 100 Thieves and you and Drake and all the things that you're doing, like you're really, you're, it's essentially you're betting on these people. Well, I, I can tell you Uber and, and Spotify is mm -hmm. two examples. Yeah. Um, with Uber, I went up to meet with a company, because of what happened with Facebook, I had the itch to invest in tech very early. Because uh, I felt I missed out on it, so I wanted to kind of stay looking at the space. Um, so I went up to meet with a, a company uh, in San Francisco and it ended up not working out, but on the way out, uh, the guy goes, let me get you an Uber to the airport. It's this new company that just started in San Francisco. It's pretty cool. So he like hits something on his phone and this black car pulls up and I was like, oh, how do I pay you? And he goes, no, it's paid for. And I was just in shock when the guy just drove me to the airport and goes, you're good. Um, so I became obsessed and I ended up contacting the guys at Uber and uh, I met Travis. And he was talking to me about how they want to launch in LA next. And we started talking and I ended up investing in Uber, um, you know, in an early stage company when it was just in San Francisco. And the reason was because when Travis and I met, this guy was intense. I mean, he was just, he told me I'm married to Uber, oh, Jesus. you know, and, and, you know, it was, it was a lot. And, you know, there's been a lot of things said about Travis, but to, I can tell you without a doubt, it's the mentality he had to work on that company that is the reason why it became such a phenomenon that it is today. Um, I have this thing called burn the ships. So mm -hmm. when the ships would arrive on the shores of their enemy, the generals would say, burn the ships. The only way you go home is by taking your enemy's ships. There's no turning back. And when I saw Travis, I saw burn the ships kind of mentality, which I had with my business. And I said, um, okay, I want to invest. And I remember when he told me the valuation of the company, which at the time I think was like 400 or $500 million, um, I, everyone who, you know, was giving me advice was like, this is insane. You know, like, that's more than the taxi company. And they're like, <laughs> 400 million. Like, and I remember this one guy uh, was like, you know, you're lucky if they get to like a billion dollars, but then, you know, maybe. And I just believed Travis. So I went with it, not knowing what it would become. Right. Um, and that was the first one. So you, you bet on entrepreneurs more than you bet on the actual company. Because um, a lot of people have good ideas, but a lot of people don't have what it takes in the hard times to keep going. So when someone tells me they're a serial entrepreneur, I kind of run. Because um, <laughs> I'm like, that means you start a lot of companies. Um, and then with Spotify, which is uh, for a lot of people in this room, I think um, when I was younger, I started to think, I got to meet this person. I'd read a book and I'd be, I got to meet that person. And I quickly realized when I would kind of watch interviews of powerful older people, they would always say how they had relationships with other powerful people for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and their power was their network of trust. So I got put on uh, Billboard's 30 under 30 list when I was like 27 or 28. And I called up the editor of Billboard and I asked if I can have the contacts of the other 29 people. 
And I think like 16 of them I knew, and the rest of them I just started e emailing and calling, cold calling, saying, hey, we're on this list together, we should meet each other, we should know each other. And at the time, there was like a 24-year-old guy from Sweden who had a company just in Sweden they'd put on the list called Spotify. Um, and I introduced myself, and he said, I'm coming to LA in two weeks, and we ended up spending like the whole week when he was in LA hanging out together, and he let me invest in Spotify early and take a large allotment in that early round because of our friendship. Um, and I always tell people, you're not gonna build the business that changed your life or be involved in the business that changed your life by finding someone who's already done it. You know, it's, it's your peers, it's the people that have the same drive as you who are sitting next to you every single day with the same dreams. If you guys bet on each other, that's gonna be the life-changing moment. And to this day, Daniel and I are really good friends and that, that company has you know, changed the world and how we look at music. And I wouldn't have been in that company if I didn't send that email to everyone my age and say, let's get to know each other. Right. And I feel like, uh, I mean, that's just, that kind of leads into like what I wanted to ask you, because going back to this, this kind of multifaceted empire that you're building, whether it's investments, companies that you own, companies that you're invest, like whatever it might be, what exactly, when you look at all these facets, like what are you prioritizing? Because I mean, you mentioned like going beyond building a great team and having them, you know, training them and having them run the ship. Like you yourself, like what? How are you prioritizing all of these, all of these different facets of this media empire that you're building? Um, today, assets. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. <laughs> I mean, I here, here, here's the thing. I, my, I never really needed a lot. And my life has provided financially a lot more than I ever dreamed or ever needed. Um, but the only reason I got to that point was because a lot of people made bets on me and helped me get to that level. And those are the people that come to my office every single day and work there and kind of signed up for the dream. So my goal now is to continue building the company so that eventually when I want to walk away, I can, but I can give them all the exit they deserve. Um, so to do that, I have to move away from the service business and build assets. That's why we're doing more TV shows and more owning IP and you know, signing more stuff to the record label and buying more catalogs. It's something that doesn't depend on us necessarily being there um, so that I have that option because my kids, my oldest will be four in February. I, okay, I will say something nice about you, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really lucky, you know, the yeah. guy sitting in that crowd coached every team I was ever on. Right. You know, my, I, me and my dad used to fight a lot when I was younger. Um, and my friends always took his side. <laughs> and, oh, and, it's, and the truth is because they wanted their dad to be like him. Right. And, um, you know, I, that's my hero. Like, I want to be a dad like he was to me. So if my business gets in the way of that, That'd be pretty stupid because I sit around every single day trying to make more money and build things bigger and go bigger and you know, do this whole thing. But then I go home and I'm like, God, we have so much. I hope my kids aren't assholes. <laughs> you know, like, so if my number one priority is to make my kids good people the way that was his and my mom's number one priority, then when you ask me what my priority is, it's to make sure that if I need to walk away, I take care of the people who helped me get there, but then I can walk away to make sure I'm the dad I'm supposed to be. And that is a perfect way to end this. Thank you so much for this. And thank you to your dad in the crowd. <laughs> thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Thank you.